Brooke and this is the Vintage Gardener MJ. So I just want to start off today's video by saying a big thank you. So I posted a video on Saturday about uh, winter sowing blue flowers and wonder of wonders is four days later and I've gotten 153 views and I picked up 18 new subscribers. So for all you new subscribers, thank you so much for subscribing and uh, welcome to the family and I hope you um, enjoy the journey that I'm going on. It's, it's going to be fun. Um, and re very real. I, um, I'm not, I'm showing you the good, bad and evil of gardening. Um, it's not going to be always pretty. I'm not going to be always wearing makeup. Like I'm currently doing a lot of times I'm hot and sweaty and my hair is sticking up at all odd angles. <laughs> so it's, it's very real because that's what gardening is. So I did notice from my statistics that like 63% of the people who are watching, who watch that video, do not subscribe. You found it because you were searching winter sewing. Well, if you're sewing, you know, searching winter sewing, that's great, but you should definitely subscribe because there are more winter sewing videos coming out and you want to keep up with them because I am definitely doing winter sewing a different way than you're going to see in most YouTube videos. Uh, most people are using milk jugs or soda jugs or that sort of thing. And if you watch the video on Saturday, you will realize that I am using solo cups and milkshake lids. So I'm calling, I'm calling it a solo cup terrarium. And if you decide to do it, I have a hashtag on Instagram that is hashtag solo cup terrarium because I would love to see what everybody else is doing. I do know that a couple of people have told me that they're going to actually try it because they thought it was pretty cool and it will actually work better than what they were doing. So since I have so many new people, I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a introduction background to the channel and where you can find me so that you don't have to necessarily go back and watch the two years of uh, videos that I've been doing. So my name is Brooke. I garden in Burlington County, New Jersey, which is zone 7A. My house I named Wildfall Manor. I purchased it in November of 2019. It is a Victorian style farmhouse, which is built in 1840. So I am restoring, renovating it and elevating it to high Victorian style. And I'm doing period style gardens around the property. The first garden that I'm putting in is called a parterre garden. Um, if you're on my YouTube channel, I have a playlist called a parterre garden. It's at this point, I think it's like 20 videos. It shows you start from finish how I created, how I am creating this garden because this is lawn that I'm turning into a garden. And so I'm going over design, drafting, uh, having irrigation installed, that sort of thing. And so if you've always wanted to start a garden and you don't know how anybody goes about it, watch the series, you know, even if you don't do things exactly the way I do it, you're probably going to find a lot of helpful information. Uh, the parterre garden is 36 by 60, so that's 2,160 square feet. In addition, I have other flower beds around my property. So in total, I have 3,000 square feet of garden that I will be um, planting up and, that, and maintaining for next year. So it's, and that's only the start, people. That's only the start. I am not a fan of lawn. Uh, my goal is to have a almost lawnless garden. I will have small bits, but really not that much. I, I much prefer to have flowers and I'm going for something that's, you know, self-sustaining and out there will be other, <laughs> you know, um, videos and stuff on that. So if you'd like to f follow me other places around the web, I'm on Facebook. I have a fan page and I'm on Instagram. I'm both on both of them. I'm the New Jersey, the Vintage Gardener NJ. I have a website called the Vintage Gardener NJ.com. I'm on Twitter. I don't really use Twitter that much, but I do kind of tweet when I have a new blog post and that sort of thing. That is, I'm, I think my handle on that one is at Gardener Vintage. I think because the Vintage Gardener was taken. It's just kind of how Twitter does things. And last but not least, I have a podcast, which is brings us back to why we're here today. So I started a podcast because there's a lot of technical information with respect to gardening. 
And, you know, I was a terrible gardener. As a matter of fact, my mom kicked me out of the garden when I was young. I came back to it when I was 21 after having watched Martha Stewart and started learning some of the mechanics behind gardening and why things do the way they do. Um, I'm a researcher. I like research. I am an attorney. So that's, you know, that's just kind of my thing. And so I'm big into researching problems and how to do, how to, properly grow things and think and that sort of thing. So anyway, one of the things I noticed over my gardening journey is that a lot of people were asking me questions and they didn't they don't understand the why's behind why people do things in gardening. A lot of times they were imitating another simply imitating another gardener. And quite frankly sometimes the gardener didn't know why they were doing things. That's just well, I saw my mom do it or my grandmother did it this way. That's just why I did it. And, you know, they may have had success, but some a lot of times what I was finding is the person who was watching tried it, failed, and they didn't understand why they weren't getting the results. So one thing that I'm really big on in my podcast and on this channel is you have to learn to garden where you are. Okay, nobody has the exact same garden. Even for somebody who lives you know, mile down the street from me. They're gonna have different soil. They may be in a microclimate. They have different lighting conditions. And so all of that goes into what goes on in their garden. There's so many different factors. And so what I'm doing the podcast is providing you the, like the foundational tools so that if you're gardening and you start having failures, you have the tools you need to troubleshoot what's going on so you can make changes. Um, so that you can you can be successful in your own yard because you know gardening is wonderful you know but you know I know it's frustrating because I was frustrated when I was younger trying to garden and couldn't understand why I was killing everything so and I understand that frustration so uh, the podcast is me distilling the vast amounts of research I've done in I don't know between I would say 20 to maybe 45 minutes of kind of lecture format um, a lot of the podcasts, most of the podcasts are strictly audio. So if you would like to um, subscribe to that, you can do that on um, iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. Some of them I have done a video podcast. Uh, for example, I did a series on, I'm doing a series on fertilizers and the last one I, one I did had a slideshow and the third episode I'm doing is going to be have, is going to have a slideshow. Um, in future, I'm probably going to be sticking strictly to audio podcasts just because I'm going to have a 3000 square foot garden. I'm um, doing a both a video and an audio podcast is just extraordinarily difficult. It's just it's time consuming. It's just time that I'm not going to have. Um, today I'm doing a video podcast because I'm also combining it with a book review. Um, it's gardening book review. So this podcast is in honor of the fact that Valentine's Day is coming up on uh, Sunday. And so I'm hoping to post a video on Saturday uh, with a showing you how to do a bouquet using principles of floriography. And I've got my notes in my research <laughs> so that I can uh, so that I can give it to you guys. So a lot of you guys are probably wondering what on earth is floriography? Trust me, you've come in contact with it. If you guys have ever read Shakespeare, like for example, Hamlet, Ophelia talks about the fact that I think one line is, and Rosemary is for remem re remembrance. Um, if you've, you've heard people say red roses are for love, you may have gone to the supermarket and seen tussy mussies that you could purchase to give to somebody. Those are all examples of your floriography. So what is floriography? Uh, floriography is selecting and using flower types that have meanings in order to communicate feelings and desires. And you've probably heard about floriography under the term, the language of flowers, okay? Now, I know that Victorians made this very popular, but they did not originate it. Um, so let's talk about where it originated. I've done some research. It seems that it's originated in two separate locations, though one is probably older than the other. But let's face it, things uh, spread, they travel. And so floriography really is, I guess you would say, uh, a, like cryptology. Crypt 
I think it's called cryptology. It's, it's you know, basically ciphers and that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm probably pronouncing the word wrong or I'm using a different word, but that, that's basically what it is. So uh, the oldest form that I've seen is was originated in Japan. And so let me tell you how it's pronounced because I am not Japanese. I believe it's pronounced Hanakotoba. Yeah, Hanakotoba. Okay, and so that's their version of language of flowers and it's very stylized arrangements to communicate feelings and that sort of thing. Um, I don't think it's entirely gone out of favor. I think you can, they still use it with the flower arrangement, but that's probably the earliest form of floriography. Um, the one that the British people made popular is from Turkey and that's called uh, Salam. Okay, and from the research that I've seen, everyone seems to be saying that in Turkey, it kind of originated in the 17th century. So that would have been uh, the 1600s. Now, how did they get to England? Well, it became popular in England because there was a lady, her name was actually Lady Mary Wirt Wirtley. Uh, she was the wife of a British ambassador in Turkey, um, in specifically in Constantinople. So in 1718, she wrote a letter to some friends talking about this, this salam. And so salam is basically uh, sending a greeting which is encoded in flowers and objects. Um, with some of the research that I did, it seems there's a suggestion that salam was the way the concubines who didn't know how to read or write would communicate with one another. That's the theory. I don't know that it's actually true. So in 1819, uh, there was a woman named Louise uh, Cortembert who went under the nom de plume, Madame Charlotte de la Tour, who wrote the first dictionary of the flower language. And the Victorian ladies picked this up because as you know, during the Victorian period, expressing, you know, your feelings and all that sort of thing was taboo. And quite frankly, you know, men and women, they, they didn't communicate. There was no such thing as sliding into anybody's DMs. You know, that's just, that's just <laughs> not how it works. Uh, the only um, men and women were only allowed to communicate with one another if number one, they were family you know, they had a blood relation or number two, they were engaged. You know, aside from that, single men and single women didn't write each other. So flowers were how they communicated. And so you could use, uh, men would use flowers to initiate a courtship, to let people, let women know I'm kind of interested. And a woman would send a response back in flowers. Now, obviously, you know, everybody started putting out dictionaries. So then what think, what became confusing is that, you know, the different dictionaries kind of define some of the flowers differently. So if you were gonna be sending stuff, you need to make sure that you guys both had the same uh, flower dictionary so that there was no miscommunication. So I think it, it, it became, you know, things progressed and, you know, probably because there was a lot of confusion, it just kind of fell out of favor. But I think it's just a really, really sweet way to communicate, especially for something like Valentine's Day, where you, you know, sometimes Valentine's Day can become so like trite. And so if you're making a, a, a flower arrangement using floriography, it will be a meaningful bou bouquet. Now, um, one of the flower dictionaries it's still in still in production today well actually it's it's an ebook that you can get because i purchased it on um apple like the ibooks um app is the 18 i think it's 84 language of flowers um now according to ibooks it says by kate greenway but it looks like there may have been another name attached to it but the one i have says kate greenway so it gives you a list of flowers um, and what they mean. Also, you can search for the flower, or for example, based upon the meaning that you're trying to convey. There's also some poetry. Now, this December, I purchased a book called The Complete Language of Flowers. Um, it's a definitive and illustrated history by S. Teresa Dietz. I found out about this book from the YouTube channel Garden Insanity. And so this is the book right here. And one thing I definitely liked about it, because the one with uh, by Kate Greenway, it's really, really short. It's only like a hundred some pages. And quite frankly, it's not all 
flower dictionary, a lot of that is poetry about flowers. So it's a very small. This particular book has the meanings of 1001 flowers. And then the other thing is that when you go to the back of the book, uh, there's an index of common flower names and then there's also an index so that um, it, it's an index of common flower meanings. And so what I like about it is that number one, it's just gorgeous. It's absolutely, it's illustrated. It's got these beautiful flowers on here. Um, it will tell you, it will tell you um, all the names of the flower. For example, Gerbera. Um, it's also known as African Daisy, Barberton Daisy, Gabara Daisy, and um, Tran Transval Daisy. And so it gives you uh, the symbol and meanings. And so the thing is, it doesn't just put the English meanings. She did research. So you have the, you know, if, you know, in Asian culture, they used it differently, or, you know, Middle Eastern culture, they had different meaning. They put all the meanings behind it. She did an incredible amount of research uh, with this particular book. Um, the other thing that's nice about this book is that it actually tells you if there are plants that are um, toxic, they, there's actually a little skull next to it. So that's kind of nice because when you're growing things, like if you have pets, like now, fortunately, my pet bumper snoop does not eat stuff out of my garden, but I do watch him and I keep him on a very short leash. But I know some people do have that issue with their dog. So at least, you know, if you're going to, you know, get some flowers or send it to somebody, you can you can kind of check and make sure that it's not toxic. So I'm going to be using this book and I will be designing some flower arrangements. So stay tuned for Saturday. So guys, thank you so much for listening. Once again, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Um, subscribe on uh, YouTube. Also subscribe on iTunes so you can keep up with the other topics that I'm going to be uh, doing in future. And I will see you guys on hopefully on Saturday with a flower arrangement. So ciao.